Being with your changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode cloud servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, the simplest cloud platform out there. And we're excited to share they now offer dedicated virtual droplets. And unlike standard droplets, which use shared virtual CPU threads, their two performance plans, general purpose and CPU optimized, they have dedicated virtual CPU threads. This translates to higher performance and increased consistency during CPU intensive processes. So if you have build boxes, CI, CD, video encoding, machine learning, ad serving, game servers, databases, batch processing, data mining, application servers, or active front end web servers that need to be full duty CPU all day, every day, then check out DigitalOcean's dedicated virtual CPU droplets. Pricing is very competitive starting at 40 bucks a month. Learn more and get started for free with a $100 credit at do.co slash changelog. Again, do.co slash changelog. Welcome to Practical AI, a weekly podcast about making artificial intelligence practical, productive, and accessible to everyone. This is where conversations around AI, machine learning, and data science happen. Join the community and Slack with us around various topics of the show at changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at Practical AI FM. And now onto the show. Welcome to Practical AI. I am Daniel Whitenack, a data scientist with SIL International, and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Benson, who is a chief strategist for AI and high-performance computing at Lockheed Martin. Hey, Chris, how you doing? I'm doing fine. How's it going, Daniel? It's going good. No complaints. It's uh, It's been kind of gloomy weather here for a while in Indiana, but, uh, you know, such as this time of year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I'm uh, I'm about to head out of town for Live Works in Boston. We're going to give a talk, and uh, it'll be it'll be over by the time this episode comes out. But uh, right now, I'm looking forward to heading off and doing that and meeting a bunch of people up there. Awesome. Well, um, I'm super excited about our our guests and our topic today. As our listeners know, we have a particular passion for the practical side of AI, hence the name of the podcast. Um, we realized that, you know, a lot of times the blockers for AI projects are not necessarily the sophisticated modeling, but the whole productionizing things and operationalizing things. And um, one of the companies that's really leading the way in this area, at least uh, I feel like, is a company called Selden. And uh, today we have uh, Giannis Kleis, who is a data scientist at Selden, um, joining us. Welcome, Giannis. Hi, I'm very pleased to be in the show. Awesome. Well, uh, we're really happy to have you. Um, maybe we could start things off by just hearing a little bit about your background and um, how you eventually got uh, into AI and data science things. Uh, yeah, sure thing. Um, so my background is actually in mathematical modeling. So I, I did my PhD at the University of Warwick here in the UK. And there's a doctor, doctoral training center uh, for complexity science, um, which is uh, basically um, applied applied maths to real world systems, and w with a particular interest on sort of systems that are made up of simple rules, but that can result in uh, interesting emergent behavior. So, uh, just to give you a couple of examples, so people in my cohort cohort worked on various uh, problems, sort of ranging from traffic modeling to uh, modeling the spread of infectious disease. Uh, one of my papers was also roughly related to that kind of thing. So, so that, that, that's, that's my background. Awesome. And did that sort of academic training, did that transfer naturally into kind of industrial data science work? I know a lot of people, including myself, maybe had some kind of uh, awkwardness or weirdness and kind of trying to transition from academic science into data science and industry. So um, it sounds like your your work maybe was more applied though. Um, yeah, I, 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 can, I can definitely relate with what you're saying because, because the incentives in academia and in the industry are, are completely different. Uh, but the, the great thing about my department was that it was very multidisciplinary and uh, people were working on all kinds of things. 
So uh, I mentioned things like uh, epidemiology research, uh, but also there was a small group of people doing machine learning research with also some industry applications. So that this was a smaller uh, portion of the of the center because we didn't have as many uh, staff members uh, doing research in machine learning, but but there were some good ones. And towards the end of my PhD. I, I started taking more interest into machine learning and started going to uh, paper clubs and um, be more interested in uh, uh, student talks about about the topic. And as I was looking for a job in the industry uh, and preferably a modeling job, I, I realized that this is this is the best way of going about it, and I, I should really. Uh, really pick up, pick up the subject uh, in my spare time if I can. So, uh, so Giannis, uh, I was wondering, uh, as we were prepping for, uh, for getting online and talking to you about this, um, is by chance uh, the company named Selden in any way related to the Harry Selden figure in the Foundation series? Uh, yeah, I was partially expecting this question, and that's that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly true. In fact, I'll tell you before I joined Selden, I, I had not read the Foundation series, even though I'd heard about it. Uh, and soon after I joined, I, I asked this exact exact same question, and afterwards I, I, I read the books. So, uh, so yeah, thanks for the question. No worries. It, it, and just for, for listeners, it had been a while since I had read the series. It's a fantastic series. It's been around forever uh, by Isaac Asimov. And so um, I was just, to, the, the idea there is uh, that this this figure, uh, Harry Selden, uh, is what's called a psychohistorian. Um, and it's essentially uh, evaluating society based on, on, on mathematics. And so they're in a galactic empire, and it's it's kind of he predicts that it's about to fall, and it's going to be thirty thousand years of chaos. And he uses this psychohistory analysis to to figure out a way to take certain actions to to narrow the chaos down to a mere a mere millennium. Uh, and and so the the series is about uh, what he does, and he creates these two foundations at each end of the galaxy, filled with scientists and engineers and stuff. But just since we made the reference, I wanted to to relay that to anybody who had not uh, read the book series. Yeah, so it, it sounds like I mean a uh, kind of a central piece of of that story is is prediction. Um, maybe kind of uh, bridging that gap. I'm assuming that's kind of the reason why the the Selden name was was chosen. But you know, as you um, so kind of filling in the gaps of your story, Giannis, you you came to to Selden. What is what is Selden's uh, relation to what they're trying to do in machine learning and AI? And um, assuming it's related to that because uh, because of the name and the relation to prediction and and all of that. Um, yeah, sure. So, so the Selden name is actually very fitting, uh, as you say, because it's all about uh, predicting the future. Um, but what what we are, are doing at Selden is we are doing machine learning deployment primarily, and and this is everything that happens after your data scientists have finished their job and uh, developed some models, uh, trained them, and achieved. Uh, good enough performance so that they're ready to go out and be applied in the business but but there's there's a lot that needs to be done for that for that step to materialize so uh, typically a data science model um, well that there's this whole setup of how you deal with the data um, and then the modeling modeling uh, uh, scripts which are typically python or maybe r scripts or maybe some other languages uh, and after the training is done, then you have maybe some some artifacts, some model weights, uh, which you can then load again uh, and then make predictions. But that doesn't really make it easy for uh, uh, people inside the business to use the model. So what needs to be typically done is uh, productionizing the model, which would, in the simplest case, involve uh, wrapping it with some uh light uh, API like a rest rest endpoint for example so that it can it can start living in the company's infrastructure and other business apps can start communicating with it by by sending requests uh, getting predictions back and then those predictions being acted on 
Could you extend that a bit and kind of talk about what the products that, that Selden has are and what projects it's engaged in and kind of give us a sense of, of what your customers or users are uh, and why they're coming to you? You know, what, what, what is it they're trying to solve uh, when, they, when they engage in your products and projects? Uh, yes, of course. So um, Selden is an open core business, meaning that our primary product which the company is built on is open source. Uh, it's called Seldom Core, and it's a machine learning deployment platform that runs on top of Kubernetes. And it basically enables uh, people to, to wrap up their trained models, uh, which can be trained using any framework. So you can be, your data scientists can work in Python or R or even Java or any, any other framework. And then they, even Java. Well, yes, <laughs> even, even if you feel like it. Yes. <laughs> and because it's model agnostic, we don't get in the way of the data science modeling part. Uh, what we're interested in was once that data science part is done, you can wrap up your models in, into Docker images and then deploy them using Selden Core, and and they it, the models will be running on Kubernetes uh, seamlessly, and you can uh, you can start using them in your business. Yeah, and uh, I, I mean, so I I've kind of heard of Selden like a, a little bit in the past, but leading up to this conversation, I, I tinkered around with some some more of what Selden is doing, and and was super impressed. Uh, so much so that I I'm encouraging one of the teams that I'm I'm working with to uh, to use some of this for for deployments because um, you know it, it was like really so, so I had a a model for uh, like reading comprehension, and you know getting that into production was as easy as writing a particular, you know, Python class with a predict function and then uh, and then uh, using some of Selden's tooling to basically just specify that, hey, I want a REST API on this port and my uh, class is called this name and then and then Selden kind of took care of the rest and and that deployment piece. So I was super Im impressed with the whole workflow and I'm sure I've missed, but you, you can tell me what other pieces of Selden um, I missed. I'm sure I only touched on a on a little bit of what you what you offer. Uh, yeah, and, th and that's very great to hear that you are uh, getting some value out of it already. So continuing on that, so so Selden Core is the open source deployment platform, and then on top of that, we are building an enterprise layer, which is uh, supposed to make things that that little bit easier. Um, and also more accessible to people that are not necessarily, not necessarily that familiar with the command line. Um, so what we envision with the enterprise option is a, a centralized place to, to monitor all your models in deployment. Uh, so both monitoring them, uh, sending off new deployments or uh, decommissioning old ones. Uh, and having a rich interface of inspecting the models, uh, how they're doing, and also have a team collaboration and authentication of different levels of permission, who's allowed to put new models in production, uh, who's allowed to decommission the models uh, and, and that kind of that kind of stuff. Cool. And I, I know that uh, Chris and I have talked several times on this show, I think, and, and um, in our conversations outside of the show about this sort of weird friction that exists between engineering teams and uh, data science or AI teams often in that, you know, the tooling that the AI people are using is is really weird um, in comparison to what engineering teams are used to, like, you know, what are these Jupiter things floating around? What, what do they do? And uh, th that creates a, a lot of friction oftentimes in terms of actually building value out of the, the AI stuff. So in terms of who's kind of latching on to this tooling that you're building, do you see kind of people coming from both of those sides? So from like a maybe a DevOps side and those trying to productionize what data science teams have passed off to them and maybe, but maybe there's people also from the AI side or what, what are you kind of seeing in terms of trends in that sense? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question actually. And from what we've seen both from uh uh, community members reaching out on our Slack channel, but also in, in conversations with some of our clients, it, it is typically a very varied bunch. And I think it depends quite a lot on how data science, uh, both the modeling part and the production part, is organized in, in companies. 
uh, and there tends to be a difference, uh, especially with uh, bigger uh, enterprises and, and smaller companies in that regard. So, so in bigger enterprises, uh, typically places like banks, uh, there appear to be quite a lot of silos between teams. So data scientists, for example, would only be responsible for the uh, development of models. And once they're kind of happy, then they just... Uh, chuck it over the wall to the uh, DevOps people or the engineers who actually have to put it in production. And that's not always the best way of doing things as the data scientists then don't get any feedback on how the models are doing and the data engineers don't get feedback about, well, how, how you actually, what, what is this thing? How do you, how do you productionize it? Whereas in small companies, it's, it, it seems to be, uh, people are doing many, many roles at once. And this is something that when I joined at Selden last year, I, I also had to pick up. So instead of just doing pure data science and modeling, I, I had to basically had to take up the engineering best practices because we are at heart uh, uh, an engineering uh, company. Uh, but yeah, the, the people are varied. So Giannis, um, how did Selden actually get interested in, in doing model inspection and interpretability? What was, the, what was the motivation that drove the company in that direction? Um, so to answer this question uh, best, it, it's maybe fruitful to discuss a bit more about the capabilities of our open source deployment platform. Absolutely, sure. So when people think about productionizing models, usually they think of single models. So you have a model, uh, you wrap it up in a single Docker image, and then you you deploy it. So if it's uh, if it's a TensorFlow model, maybe you you use TensorFlow Serving, for example. Um, or if it's a Python model, maybe you write a, a, a Flask app, uh, and then and then that, that's kind of it. You, it's a single model. You you send uh, requests of data through and get predictions back, and then you, you use them in whatever way you see fit. Uh, with Selden Core, there's there's a lot more functionality that you can have. Uh, with Selden Core, we have this um, uh, inference graph abstraction, which is part of every deployment, and uh, it can be as simple as a as a single model, uh, which is probably most use cases in the business. But you can do a lot more interesting things. Uh, for example, you can have several models running in parallel, and then you might uh, want to make predictions using all of them. And then before returning the prediction, you might want to combine all of them using some custom business logic. For example, well, it could be as easy as majority vote, or it could be... Uh, just returning all predictions. So you get ensembling at inference time uh, for free. Uh, another way you can you can use it is in, instead of uh, ensembling models at prediction time, you can you can route traffic to models. So you could have, uh, say, two models and have a router. Uh, it could be an A-B test, for example. If you've developed one model and then put a second one model, model in alongside it, you, you want to split traffic 50-50 and, and see see which one performs best. Uh, or you could have custom business logic. Maybe you have um, several models and you know that one model does best on a particular at a particular time of day, for example, and another model does better at a different time of day. So that's kind of domain expertise that can be coded in into, into the routing. Um, or, or, or similarly, if it's, a, for example, a recommendation use case, maybe you have a couple of models and some of them do better on certain demographics than, 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 and some of them do better on other demographics, and then you can code that into your uh, custom uh, business logic router as well. So, so you can do quite a lot of interesting things with uh, Selden Core beyond single model serving. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, the, so you just recently, you know, uh, released and, and are promoting this Alibi project, which it's described as being concerned with model inspection and interpretability. So is the kind of, I've heard of interpretability in terms of kind of uh, interpreting individual models, uh, maybe sort of black box models that you try to gain some insight into. But then what is the difference when you're meaning kind of model inspection versus model interpretability? Does inspection have to do with this kind of routing logic and where things act like which models actually got used for a particular prediction? Or what's the difference there and, and the distinction? Um, yeah, so that, that's a very good question. So when when 
when engineers talk about monitoring live systems, then they typically think of things like, for example, requests per second and the total load on, on the nodes that the models are living on and, and that kind of stuff. But when you're approaching the question of monitoring uh, machine learning models from a data science perspective, then there are, are a lot of very interesting and useful things that, that you might want at inference time rather than just raw predictions. So, um, uh, and this is what I sort of mean about monitoring and interpreting uh, machine learning models. So just to give you a few examples. So one is, uh, we've already touched upon it and we'll go into detail, is about model explanation. So you might want to go uh, through your uh, request logs uh, historically and see, okay, well, why why did this model make this particular prediction at this on this particular instance? And and you could you could have a uh, a component in the uh, Selden core graph that is a model explainer, and then you can basically send that historic request through and get uh, a model explanation back uh, as to roughly the logic that that it took at that particular time. Uh, other, other use cases are um, you might be interested in whether your data distribution is evolving in time. So if it's changing, your model might become stale and then uh, you might want to flag it for uh, retraining or, or decommissioning. So you would use uh, components uh, that do outline detection on the data or more generally concept drift on the data. So if, you, if your data distribution is constantly changing over time to, to, to create those alerts and, and those can all be part of your deployment, uh, of your Selden deployment. So what does the tooling look like for these sorts of things? I mean, obviously it sounds like, um, you know, I know we're about to get into Alibi and it's probably leading the way, but could you kind of describe the landscape of tooling and, and uh, you know, is it, is it custom logic in many cases or how, how are people dealing with things if they're not using Alibi? Uh, yeah, that's actually quite a broad question. And in my mind, I, I always split these sorts of questions in, into two parts. There's, there's really the... Uh, there's the engineering part and then there's the data science part. And on, on the engineering side, it really is about, okay, how, how do we, what, what sort of components do we need that will talk to a model in, in production and, and how, how will that look in, inside, say, the, uh, the Selden deployment inference graph? And maybe sometimes these components need to be stateful as well, uh, which complicates things. Uh, and then on the data science part, it's about um, it, it's less about the engineering of these components, but more about the algorithms. So, what do you actually use if you want an outlier detection running alongside your model and detect, detecting anomalous data instances? So, so that's that's the, really the data science piece. And uh, we've done some work uh, specifically on outlier detection for Selden Core, and we have examples on our GitHub about that. And uh, with Alibi, we're sort of doing more, but uh, more in the direction of uh, model expl explanation. Yeah. So um, maybe just describe it, uh, as I'm thinking about like, uh, so I'm thinking about like Selden Core and how it gives you these deployments, which might be like one model or multiple models tied together with business logic. Let's say I'm already using Selden to do those sorts of things. So how does alibi fit into that is it like a component that's kind of uh like a, a library that you call from like within those components is it kind of something that runs on the side and reaches out to those things and and tells you certain things or or analyzes logs like what is the how does it kind of operate within this uh within this ecosystem um yeah good question so so with alibi specifically um so we we got interested in model explanation uh, as uh, as a company maybe around about four months ago. And we, we sort of thought, well, okay, it, it would be good to, to support model explanations for model, for deployed models in our enterprise product. And then, so on the data science team, we did, we did uh, a bit of research of what kind of techniques are out there. And in the academic literature, there's actually a, lot, a whole lot going on and, and there's a whole host of uh, things that you could try to, to try and interrogate what your model is doing. Um, but when it came to the open source code, it's mostly research code, so it's, uh, it's not easy to use. Um, so what, what we decided is that if we want to approach this uh, seriously, then 
and basically we we need to recreate some of those uh, algorithms and so alibi was born as an open source python package for some of the uh, the more uh, famous or, or well known algorithms for model explanation so it's uh, it's a completely standalone li- uh, library so you don't need to be interested in model deployment or any kind of productionization to try and use it and you can use it in a in a jupyter notebook uh, you can play around with some models that you've trained in the same notebook and see see what kind of uh, explanations uh, uh, your models can offer on the decisions that they made. But the um, the way that it ties in together with, with Selden Core uh, and eventually Selden Deploy, which is the our enterprise layer, is that it will be the backend for producing uh, these explanations uh, of, of your models that are running in production. The Data Engineering Podcast is a weekly deep dive on modern data management with the engineers and entrepreneurs who are shaping the industry. Go behind the scenes on the tools, techniques, and difficulties of data engineering so you can learn and keep up with the knowledge to make you and your business successful. Can you give a bit of an outline about the motivation for choosing Jupyter Notebooks in particular as the core interface for your data teams? Yeah, and actually, uh, when I first joined uh, Netflix, it was sort of tossed at me. And I was definitely like, well, are we crazy? And the answer was like, we might be a little crazy. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com to listen, subscribe, and share it with your friends and colleagues. So I noticed on the Alibi website, uh, you you note that Alibi provides, and and this is kind of the air quotes here, consistent API for interpretable ML methods. And so, you know, what's in that API and is it an API that's used during training or testing or or what other other scenarios are are you there for? Yeah, well, API is maybe a bit of a grandiose term. Uh, it, it literally uh, refers to to the way we've structured these uh, these various kinds of uh, explanation algorithms within the library. So it's as simple as uh, so you could you could think of it in terms of the scikit-learn API, which we all know, which is yep. which which typically has two steps for any given uh, model or estimator. You have the fit step, which takes in uh, a training set, and then then you have the prediction step. So you can you can uh, make predictions on new instances, uh, and with the model explanations, it's it's a reasonably similar process actually. So so some explanation methods require access to the training set to be useful. So you would have a similar fit step, uh, not always, but in some methods, and then really at explanation time explanation almost exactly maps to the predict uh, step. So you would have. Uh, rather than model.predict, you would have an explainer.explain and pass in a, a single instance that you want to be explained uh, why, why the model made the prediction that it did. Cool. Uh, is this kind of model agnostic in the same way that, you know, Selden deployments are in the sense that if you want to use TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever, um, then you these things kind of work out of the box? Or is this kind of restricted to particular like reference implementations or that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a very good question to ask. Um, so in the first iteration of Alibi, uh, we're now in version two, but we're, we're still mostly focusing on what we call black box explanation methods. So, and when I say black box, uh, I don't mean a complicated neural network that you've created. What I mean is that all you have is access to a predict function. And this can be very general. It can be, it can be, uh, literally something that just takes in arrays and, and, and spits out other arrays so it can be it can be as general as a, as an api uh, that, that's already sort of running in production so uh, so we have a couple of methods in alibi that all work on these sort of black box uh, black box models so it's it's a uh, it's very portable we, we do have in our roadmap more uh, model specific methods because once once you start to know a bit more about what your model actually is then then you have a lot more leeway and a lot more interesting methods as well that you can apply if you, if you know the model architecture or uh, or the loss function, for example. So uh, now that we've kind of 
talked a, a lot about what Alibi is in general, what the, the API is like and, and how you integrate it into your workflow. Um, I'd be interested because we've talked about, you know, model interpretability in general on, on this uh, show before, but I'd love to dive into a few more specifics because this is, you know, really a, a practical project that, that people can use. So one of the things that you talk about, so you, you talk about a, a lot of different methods. Um, maybe one that we could start with is you talk about anchors and anchor explanation. Um, could you kind of describe what, what that is in general and, and when it might be useful? Uh, yeah, sure. And uh, just just before I dive into the anchor method in particular, um, I just want to pick apart a bit what 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 we really want from model explanations, right? So yeah, that'd be great. So so there's there's, there's sort of a, a couple of different notions of uh, model explanation. Um, in particular, people talk about global explainability, where you typically want to know. How the model performs, sort of on average, say on on, on the whole whole of training set to, to try and draw some conclusions from it, um, and then there's the local explanation, which uh, is uh, uh, which has been the focus of Alibi in the first few releases, uh, which is uh, answering the question given a specific instance and a model prediction. Why did the model make this prediction? Uh, but uh, as you can already tell, the, the, this, this question is not well defined. I mean, you, you can't really answer it. Why, why the model made a prediction? You need to try and pick it apart a bit more. So, so one thing you can do is you can try and ask human interpretable questions. What that you would like about this model decision uh, to be answered, and then given those questions, you can you can try and find algorithms that sort of approximate the answers to those kinds of questions. So, so for example. Um, you, you might ask, okay, given this instance and this prediction, what is sort of a minimal subset of features and their values uh, given which the model will make the same prediction regardless of everything else? So that's that's what we call an, an, an anchoring question. So that's where the anchor technique comes in. So you ask an interpretable question and then you go ahead and see, okay, how can I write an algorithm to do this? So in that case with the anchor explanation is like, what's the sort of, uh, how would you kind of phrase these these anchor questions, I guess? Or what would be the, the thing that you would be looking to come out of Alibi that would help you kind of with that explanation or, or make that um, explanation uh, logically? Um, so, so the great thing about this is that these interpretable questions are asked when you want to design a new explanation method, but once the method is, is, is designed, you only need to be aware of what question that method is answering. So, um, so the anchors method would return, say, a small subset of features of the original instance uh, and their values, which would uh, result in the same model prediction, say, 95% of the time. So let me just give you a quick example, uh, one example that we also have on the on the website so it's the, um, the sort of semi-famous uh, census uh, income data set uh, from the early 90s composed in the US and it's it's a binary classification problem of predicting whether a given individual will be uh, a, a low income individual or a high income individual and the threshold is uh, whether they make uh, less than or more 50 more than $50,000 a year so and and the the various features of each individual are their uh, education level, their occupation, their relationship status, um, but also their gender and race, and um, various kinds of other features. So so it's a, it's a fairly standard setup. You've got tabular data, and you can train a binary classifier to to solve this problem. So once you have your classifier trained, you can then pick individual instances and run the anchor algorithm to f try and find for each instance which which really are the pertinent set of or subset of features that were important for this particular prediction so for example i i might pick a uh, say a, a woman who's uh, mid 30s who's been separated and may, maybe her profession is uh, working in the government and I, I run the model and it says, okay, it's a, it's a lower income individual. Then I run the anchor explanation and what I get out is, okay, my anchor for this explanation is that their marital status is 
separated and the work category is government work and with those two present the model will make the same decision 95% of the time regardless of all the other features so that's where the name anchor comes from it anchors this decision to to really what makes what makes the most uh, importance for this particular uh, individual so wondering if you could uh, kind of tell us a little bit about maybe a different method that you've implemented that might be useful in a different situation or or possibly in the same situation in a different way. I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but... Um, yeah, sure. So uh, I, I can I can talk through another uh, method or, or rather a couple of methods that we have in Alibi. Um, so when we first kicked off Alibi, we, we sort of wanted, impl- wanted to implement methods that didn't really have good implementations, but that were interesting and had received attention in the academic community. So, so anchors is one such method. Um, and uh, actually, it was, it was, it was. Uh, I'm not sure if if you know, it was designed by uh, by the same people behind Lime, which uh, sort of kicked off the whole interpretability. Uh, of machine learning uh, area. Yeah, that's the uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember is the one that kind of uh, gives you linear estimations of, of certain uh, relationships or, or, or something like that. Yeah, so what Lime does, it, it, it kind of fits a surrogate model, uh, a linear surrogate model around the around the instance. It's basically trying to approximate the, the nonlinear uh, decision boundary with uh, with a linear one. So it, and, and then the weights of that linear model can get interpreted as, 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 uh, feature importances. So, so it was, uh, it was sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of a very familiar technique, but it has its, uh, its shortcomings. And then the authors of the, of, of Lime, um, came up with anchors, which they feel is, is sort of a, a better, better solution for this problem. Cool. So we talked about the, the anchor explanation. You list a, a, a few different methods. Like you were saying, there, there's multiple methods that are implemented in Alibi. There's, you know, the trust scores and counterfactual instances and other things. But I was wondering, maybe, maybe as we kind of move towards the end of our, of our conversation here, if you could just give us a little bit of an idea of you know, where Alibi is, is heading and, and maybe also like what, what Selden has in mind kind of for the, for the future of Selden core and Alibi and maybe, maybe other things like where are you headed? Um, yeah. So for Alibi, we have a reasonably ambitious roadmap. I mean, I, I mentioned sort of our API mimics the scikit-learn API, but for, uh, but for model explanations, so we we kind of in an ideal world we would be the uh, scikit learn of model explanations, bringing bringing various techniques together in, in one place uh, for people to to use and compare and contrast what makes sense for their use case. So other than that, um, so that would be like like scikit learn. You can you know if you're wanting to do classification, you can choose from any of you know, whatever it is, I, I actually don't know how many, like 20 or 30 or whatever, uh, implemented uh, methods for, for classification. So you're kind of imagining Alibi would kind of have that zoo of explainability methods that you could kind of call using a, a standardized API. Is that is that kind of the, the thought? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of our, our ambition with, with Alibi eventually. Cool, cool. Yeah, what about... Um, you know, Selden, uh, Selden in general, are there, are there other things on the, on the horizon that you can share or, or maybe just things that you're excited about in the AI community or at Selden specifically? Yeah. So, so I'm not sure if you're aware, but this week is actually the, uh, the, uh, COGEX event, uh, here in London, which is the sort of festival of AI where, uh, lots of companies sort of go and, and, uh, and present the, the sort of emerging technology to, to facilitate all kinds of um, machine learning use cases in the industry. So what we're actually uh, doing there this week is we're, we're demo, demoing a, a sort of a, a first uh, sort of version of our enterprise uh, product, Selden Deploy, which which has also anchor explanations running with a live request. So that's that's, that's kind of quite exciting from a product development uh, perspective. So I guess as you are are looking at that, is that I'm just I was curiosity with that particular uh, event. Is that uh, is that more of a conference or is it more of um, kind of companies coming together to just demo their their thing? What 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 style of event is it? And is this kind of a are you essentially taking the opportunity to announce new product uh, features in that? 
with with the one you just talked about? Um, yeah, so it's it, it's it's kind of a bit of both. There are speakers, mostly industry speakers, but but it's also uh, so companies have their own stands where they can demo their technology and, and that kind of stuff. So um, I expect there to be fewer people from the sort of pure machine learning research community, especially as it also coincides with uh, ICML this week. Cool. And uh, I mean, first off, congrats on the the announcement. That's really it's really exciting. I uh, can't wait to see uh, what's next and the hype around around that for sure. Um, but uh, let's say people um, are listening to the podcast. They want to, you know, get hands on with Alibi and or Selden Core and or Selden Enterprise. What what are the best ways for people to kind of uh, get get up and running with Selden or or Alibi? Where can they where can they find resources and get help? Um, yeah, probably the best resource is our, is our docs. So you can just go on docs.seldom.io and that will take you to the relevant documentation, either for Alibi or, or for Selden Core, whichever takes your, takes your fancy. So it has uh, it has a lot of information to, to get you up and running. Cool. And do you have any, um, uh, no, no worries if, if you don't, but as you've kind of explored this whole area of you know, interpretability and explainability. Um, do you have any recommendations maybe for people that are interested in learning more about that subject in general, as far as resources where they could learn about what has been done or what people are researching? What's what's the best way to find those that sort of information? Um, yeah, so one thing I can definitely recommend and, and something that we kind of got a lot out of when we were first developing Alibi is Christoph Molnar's book on interpretable machine learning. So it's, as the title says, it's about, it's a book about interpretability techniques and it's, uh, it's fully open source. It's available online and it's, it's really well written. So if people want to get into the topic, then, then I think that's the best, best place to start by far. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I know I'm excited to, to dig in more to Selden and to, to Alibi. Now I understand a lot more about kind of how, how it fits into my into my workflow. Um, I encourage people if you have uh, questions about uh, or, or thoughts about Alibi or, or Selden, of course, they have their uh, Slack channel, but we also have our um, practical AI Slack channel, um, which you can find at changelog.com slash community and our LinkedIn page as well, um, if you just search for Practical AI. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, machine learning, interpretability, and inspection. Um, really appreciate uh, really appreciate you joining us, uh, Giannis, and hope to stay in contact and really looking forward to seeing what, what Selden uh, does in the future. Um, yeah, th- thanks very much for having me on the show. And I, I would just like to quickly thank my coworkers, Arno van Merveren and Giovanni Vacanti, who both are working on the Alibi Alibi project and without whom I couldn't have done the work. Awesome. Appreciate that. And uh, I, I really hope that we can run into you at a, at a conference sometime and, and, uh, and catch up. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Practically AI. If you enjoyed this show, do us a favor. Go on iTunes, give us a rating, go in your podcast app and favorite it. If you are on Twitter or a social network, share a link with a friend, whatever you got to do, share the show with a friend if you enjoyed it. And bandwidth for changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. And we catch our errors before our users do here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com slash Changelog. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Check them out. Support this show. This episode is hosted by Daniel Whitenack and Chris Benson. The music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at changelaw.com. When you go there, pop in your email address, get our weekly email keeping you up to date with the news and podcasts for developers in your inbox every single week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.